How are you doing? Welcome to the uh, catechism class uh, once again. Westminster Larger Catechism, uh, that is, um, that we are studying. Uh, recently, we've been looking at the appointed mediator, our Lord Jesus Christ, sent by his Father into the world to uh, mediate on behalf of sinners and to fetch them back to God. Uh, we've seen who the recipients uh, of his mediation are and, of course, how uh, the same has been applied and the outworking, uh, the eternal life, salvation, heaven, uh, and, of course, the consequences of continuing in unbelief, refusing the mediator and his work. But now uh, here in the catechism, um, he turns, the catechist, he turns to um, the business of what it is, um, the duty uh, that God requires of men, all men that is, uh, made by God. He is sovereign uh, over all and he has uh, every right uh, to command us. And so we move on to a new section now. Uh, what uh, is the moral law is the question that um, uh, the Catechist asks us the, today. In uh, Deuteronomy chapter 5, with an introduction to uh, the Ten Commandments, uh, we read, And Moses called all Israel and said unto them, Hear, O Israel, the statutes and judgments which I speak in your ears this day, that you may learn them and keep and do them. The Lord our God made a covenant with us in Horeb. The Lord made not this covenant with our fathers, but with us, even us, who are all of us here alive this day. The Lord talked with you face to face, in the mount out of the midst of the fire. I stood between the Lord and you at that time to show you the word of the Lord, for you were afraid by reason of the fire and went not up into the mount, saying, and then follows on the Ten Commandments. That's the mediator of the Old Testament, uh, Moses, the servant of the Lord. And then in Romans chapter 12 and verse 1, we read, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So question and answer 93 of the Westminster Larger Catechism. What is the moral law? And the answer given is the moral law is the declaration of the will of God to mankind, directing and binding everyone to personal, perfect and perpetual conformity and obedience thereunto in the frame and disposition of the whole man, soul and body, and in performance of those duties of holiness and righteousness, which he owes to God and man, promising life upon the fulfilling and threatening death upon the breach of it. That's the catechist's answer to his own question, what is the model of model law? The moral law, God's law, of course, goes right all the way back to the beginning, even to Adam. Adam was given a rule of obedience. That's what we call a law. And that rule of obedience was a moral rule of obedience. Because God has made us moral creatures men and women, that is, 
unlike the rest of the creatures that God has made, animal kingdom and such like, um, we, of course, are made, were made, that is, in the beginning, in the image of God, moral image of God. So we are rational and we are moral creatures. And God demands of us that we live in moral obedience to him. The rule of obedience that was given to Adam uh, back in the beginning uh, was concerning uh, the fruit in the garden, the forbidden fruit. Adam, you have to understand, he was not just the first man, but he was the head of the entire human race. He stood, if you like, he stood in our place. He represented us. What he did had consequences for you and me even today. All his posterity, all of mankind, from the beginning right to the end. Now, some people would argue and say, well, that's not fair. That's not fair. I wasn't there. Um, uh, I have no responsibility for what Adam did or didn't do. Oh, yes, you do. Just as a child is, um, uh, there are consequences for a child by its parents' actions. As a child, your parents represented you. You might not have liked it. You might not agree with their representation now, but then they had authority over you. They represented you. So what they did had consequences upon you. If they lived, uh, for instance, if they lived um, degenerate and apostate lives, then that would have had an effect on you as a child. They represented you, you see. And so too with governments. I have a government over, over me just as you do. Some governments are better than others. Some are tyrannical. Some are fierce and some of them are, um, well, downright absolute wicked. But they are the appointed government authority appointed by God. Check out Romans 13, if you will. And so the government, the government represents the people. No chance whether they like it or not. Now, the government here of the United Kingdom uh, decide to say, uh, go to war against uh, Russia. Now, I might not agree with what the government are doing, but um, I have no say in the matter. Yeah, they, they, they represent me. And so I will be caught up into that a dreadful and fearful war. So you see, Adam was our representative. And what he did or didn't do has consequences upon all of us right down to this day, right to the end of the age. Now, Adam was made in the beginning. Adam was made in a state of righteousness. He was perfect. He was perfectly righteous. No unholiness, no wickedness, no sin. Now, theologians, they talk about Adam being in a state of innocence. I don't like that word. I think that word is wrong. Because innocence, that suggests that, well, you don't know. I'm innocent. I, I, I wasn't aware. I didn't know that there was a law against this, you know. Um, so I, I'm innocent, you know. Um, if you don't know, then you're innocent. But Adam did know. Adam was given a rule of obedience. So he wasn't innocent, but he was righteous. He was righteous. He had a heart for God, desire for God. He lived for God. He lived in perfect obedience to God until that is, until that is, he disobeyed God. He disobeyed the rule of obedience that God gave to him. God warned him in the day that thou eatest thereof, that's the fruit of the tree, the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. 
Adam disobeyed God. He disobeyed God for himself, but he disobeyed God for you as well. All of us, myself included. And so Adam, it now in this state of sin, having disobeyed God, could never, never merit work for his way back to God, into righteousness with God, and to eternal life. Now, um, again, the Westminster Divines who, uh, who uh, put together this uh, Westminster Larger Catechism and other documents too that we have, uh, they speak about um, Adam being under a covenant of works. Now, I don't know where on earth they get that from, but and who am I to disagree with such godly men? But I do not find any covenant of works in the Bible. There's one covenant alone, and it's a covenant of grace. Adam could not work his way back to God. Adam could not merit, no matter what he did, in this, even in the state of righteousness, he could not merit, he could not work for eternal life. That's a given, always has been a given, was then and is now. So um, he could never merit, he could never work for righteousness, for eternal life, do all that he could, he could never, never merit eternal life. Jesus tells us, um, in the Gospels, he says, when you've done everything, when you've done all that you ought to do, you are still, you are yet an unprofitable servant. So all the doing in the world, all the working in the world by Adam, by you or anybody else, will not gain, will not get eternal life. That is by grace alone. No other way. So for Adam's disobedience, he was expelled from the garden. Now, the ungodly, of course, they mock this um, this very uh, thing, this business. You know, they I, I've had them come to me, you know, and they say, oh, you know, uh, God, God destroyed Adam, the whole human race, because, because a man ate a piece of fruit. No, no, no. No, uh, that misunderstands it completely. It wasn't simply and only because he ate a piece of fruit. It was because he disobeyed the moral law of God. That's why he was expelled from the garden. Because God had commanded him. God gave him a rule, um, a rule of moral obedience. And Adam disobeyed God. God commanded Adam as he commands all men, all men without exception, that we are to love God. How do you express love for God? By doing what he tells you to do. By not doing what he tells you to do, disobeying his moral law, you are giving God the finger. You're telling him no. So Adam disobeyed God, the model, the rule of obedience given to him, and thus he was expelled from the garden. And again, the ungodly, unbelieving mocked this, so he was thrown out of a garden. Big deal. No, that is symbolic. It wasn't just a case of being expelled from a garden. He was expelled from fellowship with God. The love of God, communion with God, he lost it all. Everything that he was given in God making him, he lost it all. He was expelled from the fellowship of God and only one way by which he could be restored to that fellowship and communion with God is the same way in which you and I today can be restored to fellowship and communion with God, and that's by God's covenant of grace. Free, particular grace. 
that grace, as we have seen in previous lessons, that God affords to his elect. Through Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Adam was given the first promise, the first gospel promise, the promise of the seed of the woman, Jesus Christ, the one by whom he and others after him could be restored to God's favour. The two trees in the garden, the um, tree of life and the tree with the knowledge of good and evil, those two trees are symbolic again, symbolism, you see. There's a lot of symbolism in the Bible. If you go to the book of Revelation, the very last book of the Bible, you'll find a lot of symbolism there. Of course, there are a lot of people who take these symbols literally and to their destruction, but, but that's another matter altogether. But these two trees in the garden, they represent, yeah, one represents life, that's a yes to God, and a yes to God's rule of obedience to his moral law. The other tree, the other one, is a no to God, disobedience to God's moral law. Adam said no to God. Sin came into the world and death by sin. And the rest, of course, well, as we say, is history. But understand this, that Adam and Eve, our first parents, our representatives, they did this, this act of disobedience that brought sin into the world, they did this as your representative, whether you like it or not, is no matter. That's what Adam was. He was the head of the human race. Our representative and what he did, he did on behalf of us. And there is only one way back. There is only one way by which the damage that Adam did and caused can be undone is through the last Adam, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who is likewise the head of a race, not the entire human race, but the race of his people, those given to him by God before the foundation of the world, the elect of God, the community of God, the church of God, the true church of God, that is. Jesus Christ, the last Adam, he is our representative. And so therefore, everything he does has a consequence to us. We, that is, who believe in his name and to trust in his reconciling work. Yes to Jesus is eternal life. So then secondly, the more going on to the moral law, the moral law which of course is expressed in uh, the Ten Commandments, to in due course, Lord willing, um, the, the moral law of God, um, which still stands now, the Ten Commandments, Jesus, he sums it up this way, he says, um, the sum of the God's law is that we should um, love God with all our heart, soul, strength, and mind, and love our neighbor as ourselves. But then the Ten Commandments, they too, they too are a summary of God's law, not its entirety. But of course, there in those Ten Commandments, uh, you'll get um, all that you probably need to know. But the model of God is um, it's a divine revelation, revealing, that is, of the will of God. It's not just, um, it's not just 10 good suggestions. You know? It's not just um, you know, 10 good ideas for, uh, and maybe just uh, simply and only for religious people. No, it's the divine revelation of God's will, what God wills, God desires, God requires of you and I, that is of all men, 
everyone born into this world. Everyone, all are subject to it. Whether they have actually read it in print or not, or heard it spoken directly. It is um, the heathen in the darkest Amazonian jungle that the most obscure place that you could think of are subject to it. We are all subject to the moral law of God, every single one of us. The secularist, the atheist, they can raise their voices, they can complain, they can shout and argue all they like, but they are subject to the moral law of God just as anybody else. Everyone with their exception. It is binding upon the consciences of all men born into this world. And that means Christians too. I hear these Christians who, who tell me that, well, they're free. There is no such thing as absolute freedom. We are set free to obey God. We are saved in order to obey God. Jesus Christ came into the world at his incarnation, it was said. Thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins, not in their sins. I hear these people who say that the law is not binding upon them. They are under grace. Grace was given to us to enable us to obey the law of God. We could not do it before. It was impossible. God said to us, to all men, love me. But the trouble is man cannot love God, cannot obey God, could not obey God. And neither could you, if you're a Christian now, neither could you prior to being born again justified before God until God put his life into your soul and put his love into your heart. You did not even desire the law of God. Never mind, keep the law of God. You were impotent, you were powerless, you were trapped by your sin, by lawlessness, alienated from God, separated from God by your iniquities, your lawlessness. So grace is given to us to enable us to do what we couldn't do before, albeit imperfectly, albeit imperfectly, but grace is given to us. We are saved. We are saved from that condition of lawlessness. What, to carry on in lawlessness? Is that what these antinomian creatures are saying to me? Oh, I'm free. I can I can live as I please. The moral law of God, the, the God's rule of obedience has, has has nothing on me. Try and tell me that Jesus Christ went to the cross, suffered and bled and died, and bore the wrath of God that was due to your lawlessness, so that you could live just as well you think is fit. The moral law of God, I would say, was well, binding upon everyone, everyone. But surely, if Jesus Christ died, bled and died for your sins, suffered on that cross in order that you might escape the damnation of hell for your lawless deeds, does that not put a greater responsibility on the likes of you and I? I would, I would say so. God's law, his rule of obedience, is as God is, unchangeable. I am the Lord, I change not. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday and today and forever. As is God, so is his law, unchangeable. And still binding, still binding upon every one of us. And of course, if you're not a Christian, well, it's in that day, of course, when God judges you in righteousness by Jesus Christ. 
that you will in that day give account for your lawless deeds. You'll be shown every time that you broke every one of God's commandments. No other gods before me. If you subscribe to some kind of heathen religion, Islam, Buddhism, Confucianism, Roman Catholicism, the Watchtower Society, you subscribe to some kind of false religion or you worship some kind of weird deity, even yourself, thou shalt have no other gods before me. If you've lived in adultery, thieving and lying, every one of those commandments, every one of them, I tell you, you've broken every single one of them. Trash them underfoot. All the days of your life, And so therefore, accountable, not only for the sin nature that you have by conception and birth, that too, you're accountable for Adam's sin. Even, even, worth, even, even had you kept the moral law of God perfectly all your days, you haven't, but if just for argument's sake, let's, let's say that you had, you would still be guilty in Adam responsible for his sin. So on that day, that's this is what you will give account for, for Adam's sin and for all yours, all yours. Everything that has emitted from your sinful nature, all the transgressions of God's holy and perfect law. That's why you need a savior. That's why you need a mediator. That's why you need somebody to bring you back from God. That's why to God. That's why you that's why you need somebody to repair the damage that Adam has done and that you have done. And that somebody is Jesus Christ. There is no other, no one big enough, good enough, powerful enough, able enough to reconcile such a wretched rebel as you are to God. You need Jesus. You need Jesus more than you need to breathe. Yeah. Of course, the modern idea is, you know, when the law of God is mentioned, the commandments of God is mentioned, is that, uh, well, these ideas are, are way too narrow and um, uh, static, and we need to move on. You know, this is the this is the twenty first century, don't you know? And of course, well, we get this even amongst Christians. You know, you know it's time to move on. I mean, there, there's a move. Um, there's a move presently, uh, don't you know, to um, uh, equalize. You know, to make. Um, you know, to tone down the language about homosexuality, sodomy, I mean, sodomy and lesbianism, you know, to same-sex relationships, same-sex attraction, you know, words like that they use, you see, to, to dumb down the language, you know, and, and um, um, because the, the idea is, you see, that, well, this is the 21st century, you know, and these things have become, these, these things, don't you know, preacher man, these things are acceptable in society today. It's all been legalized. Abortion too, that's another one, you know. These things have been legalized, you know. It's okay now. Society has moved on. I do not care how far society moves on. It's every move onwards, just another move away from God until they filled up the cup of iniquity, until they can devise no more ways of sinning against the Almighty, and then the, the end will come, the sword will fall finally and fully. But that's the thinking of moderns, even modern Christians. Yeah. That the law is way, way too narrow, you know, and static, and we need to move on from this. So they start altering the language and uh, 
make it acceptable to Christians. There are moves even within evangelicalism here in the United Kingdom to equalize same-sex marriage and attractions. Even as I speak. God's law is just as suitable for the 21st century as it was, as it was back in Noah's, uh, Moses' day, in Deuteronomy chapter 5. God's law has not changed one iota, and his moral requirements of men and women, Christian and non-Christian, every one of us, his moral requirements are binding upon our consciences. And woe is them, woe is them who tamper with God's law and seek to make it, make God to say that which he does not say and to demand what he does not demand. The moral law of God, the rule of obedience that God has given to mankind is that of absolute obedience in every part of life. Not just the religious bits, not just in church on Sunday or out of it, a place of worship or out of it. The entirety of life in the place of employment, in the place of employment, when the conversations begin, you know, about the origins of life, maybe, um, the origins of the universe, perhaps, in six days, God made heaven and earth. About the preciousness, the sanctity of life, when conversations arise about abortion, then our language should be, as is God's. Thou shalt not kill. When they start to talk about their sexual deviance and perversion, we bring the law of God to bear. Thou shalt not commit adultery, which covers every form of sexual activity that you care to think of. So the entirety in your workplace, honesty that is in your workplace, you know, um, honest dealings. Um, when it says thou shalt not steal, that means from your employer too. Um, his time, his money, his goods. Our thought life, what we think, we are to think God's thoughts after him. Because it's our thinking that leads us astray. When we think wrongly, when we think contrary to what God demands, then that's what leads us into trouble. As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. Our thought life, our speech, our words and our actions, they're to be not just good, not just good. God requires absolute obedience in every part of life. He requires perfection to the uttermost. Be ye holy as I am holy. Now, whether you can attain it or not, that's another matter. But that's what it requires of you. That's what it requires of you. We are obligated to God to perform duties of holiness that we owe to God, first and foremost to God, our sovereign, our maker, and to our neighbor, as Jesus says, the sum of the commandments, God's commandments, to love God, obey God, that means, with all the heart, not just outwardly, not just outwardly, not just going through the motions, with all the heart, soul, strength, and mind, loving God, fervently, intensely, from your innermost being and giving to him the worship that is due to him, a worship that is controlled by his moral law. 
not a worship that suits you. You know, with rock and roll and rap music. But a worship that is pure, that is holy, as God is holy, that is ordained of him, regulated by his word. A pure worship to God and the welfare of your neighbor. Anybody, absolutely anybody who God brings across your path. that person's welfare. I would say that their, my neighbor's welfare, not just, but I would say that the, the highest good that I can do for my neighbor is to bring the gospel to bear upon them. Because you see this perfection to the uttermost that God requires of men and women is just absolutely impossible. It's not possible for a Christian who's been regenerated, born again, justified, brought to be able to live in obedience to God imperfectly. But if you are outside of Christ, if you have not been regenerated, then you are in a dark, dark place because absolutely and everything you do is contrary to God. Think and say and do is contrary to God. It can't be any other. That's what it means, that's what the New Testament means when it uses the term on ungodly. Christ died for the ungodly. Those who are contrary to God in their nature and in their practice too. Can't be any other. Naturally conceived in sin and born in sin and live in sin, ungodly that is, all your days, contrary, absolutely contrary to God with your fist in your maker's face. That's the state of mankind. That's what it's come to. That's what Adam brought to us, sin and death and hell. That's the end of our sin. And so the penalty you see was as God said to Adam, in the day that thou eatest thereof, that is to say, in the day that thou dost disobey me, thou shalt die. And Adam died spiritually, expelled from the fellowship and communion with God, the love of God, separated from God. And that separation, of course, well, that's a life apart from God. And life apart from God is what? Death. Sin's wages. The wages of sin is death. Life apart from God, that's, that's a bit of a misnomer because there is no life apart from God. Just existence. Just existence. So this, this separation and alienation from God, God is your enemy, not your friend. Um, the death of the body, it is appointed unto man once to die. But of course, that's not the end because death is not a state of non-being. Well, you will still exist, but in a state of death, everlasting death. It is appointed unto man once to die, but after this comes the judgment. That's why as one young woman once asked me the question, why do people have to die? Because they're sinners. Because they live in disobedience to God. Because they don't love God. Because they're alienated from God. Because of sin. But then, of course, that separation, that alienation from God becomes everlasting. Eternal. 
with no way back to God from sin, no way back to his love and to his favor, to communion, to fellowship with God. That is, if you die, if you breathe your last thing go out of this world, then that's your state and condition eternally. As the proverb says, where the tree falls, there it lies. There's no shifting the tree after it's fallen. And there's no shifting you after you've fallen out of this world in sin. You are now, you are then in an unrepairable state and condition for all eternity. But now, while you have the breath of life in you, now you're able to hear the gospel, the good news, that Christ indeed died for the ungodly. Those who know that they are ungodly, that is. Those who know, understand, get it, that they are sinners in Adam and in practice too. Christ died for such people. Those who will come to him, those who will trust in him and be, that is, in the last Adam, Jesus Christ, those who will trust in him, believe on his name, he will reconcile you to God. And you too will become a recipient of the grace of God, the free grace of God. Can't work for it. Can't work for it. You can't start being good for it. Can't start keeping God's commandments for it. Adam couldn't merit eternal life and neither can you or I. It's only by grace, the free grace of God, the covenant of grace that brings men and women into a covenant of friendship with God. That's what it is. A union and a communion of friendship with God. Life, life eternal forgiveness for all the lawlessness all the transgressions all god white justified freely by his grace grace mercy great great mercy pity upon sinners lost because of what adam brought to us pity in the heart of god and that grace that love, that mercy, that pity, well, it's revealed, it's seen, it's manifest in this, that God appointed and anointed a mediator, his own son, his only begotten son, and sent him into the world to die on a cross, rise again from the dead, alive forevermore. The one, the last Adam, who accomplished what the first Adam could never do. He's done for us. He gives us better, better than what Adam had. Adam was made righteous, but it was a righteousness that was losable. But the man, the woman, who trusts in Jesus in the last Adam, is given a righteousness that they can never lose. They can never, ever be separated from God again, from the love of God again in Christ Jesus. I give unto them eternal life. Wretched sinners, lawless, ruined, undone. I give unto them eternal life and they shall never perish. Read the commandments. Let them convict you. Let Moses take hold of your self-righteousness and shred it for you. Yeah. Let them take you down into the, into the uttermost of despair till you see yourself as absolutely wretched and ruined. Damned. And when you get to that place, when you've hit the bottom, then look up and look away from Moses because he can't do nothing for you now. 
and look to the last Adam. Look to Jesus. Look unto me, all ye ends of the earth, and be saved. Look to the Son of Man, the Son of God, Jesus Christ, who came into the world to save wretched sinners like you and I. And put all your trust and all your hope in him. He will not disappoint you, but save to the uttermost all those who come to God by him because of the grace, the mercy, the pity, and the love of God. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ today, and thou shalt be saved. God bless you, and if you're around, hopefully, Lord willing, see you tomorrow.